so uh, welcome back, everybody. Uh, hope you all had a good lunch. Our uh, third panel is uh, moderated by uh, Sam Sakharov. Here on my right, uh, Sam is also, Sam is one of the uh, co-directors of the center, and he's also the uh, Reese Professor of Constitutional Law here at NYU. Um, Sam, I promised when the, uh, everyone left for lunch that the afternoon panels were gonna be as spectacular as the ones in the morning, so you're on. Thank you. Um, I wanna start actually by taking a moment of privilege to say something about the center uh, because um, I think that uh, we can s uh, stand here quite proudly after the morning session as being a fascinating introduction into the world of uh, litigation finance, at least for those of us who are not in that world. Um, this is a very unusual academic enterprise. This was set up as essentially a joint venture of plaintiffs and defense firms who decided to put up a significant amount of money with a five-year commitment. And it has two unusual features in terms of academic uh, enterprises of this sort. First, we are not naming anything after anyone. So this is not the, uh, the uh, you know, you pick uh, school of laws. Uh, actually, for a certain price, that is available. You know, if, if, if you need it, we can talk about it. Uh, uh, here is our fourth co-director who just walked in, Troy McKenzie, who's uh, just got fired from the Department of Justice. Is that why you're here? And, uh, Playing hooky, so uh, Troy's one of the founding co-directors. But so nobody, there's no honors given to anybody in particular for the significant contributions we have received. The other thing that's completely unusual about this is that more than half of our board of directors and the people who sustain this enterprise had no prior institutional affiliation with NYU. So these are folks who gave of their time and their money and they come to our board meetings and they sustain our activities despite the fact that this was not their institution. It's is simply a commitment that there needed to be a place where we could have discussions like the one we've been having and will continue to be having. So this is a great achievement for us as an institution and we're very pr uh, proud and very happy for the work of Peter and Linda and for the uh, support that we've, uh, we've had in this enterprise. So let me introduce this panel. Um, my uh, first exposure to the world of uh, entrepreneurial financing of litigation as a distinct area of legal enterprise uh, took place about five, six years ago, the first time I was lecturing in Australia. And I kept being introduced to this concept of litigation finance that was increasingly taking hold there and playing a very significant role in shaping the kinds of cases that were viable under the Australian system where there are not contingent fee fees, there are uplifts, but the, there is fee shifting so that somebody had to immunize the lead plaintiff, for example, in a securities class action. And the world of litigation finance had taken hold there. And now all of a sudden you had financiers coming in and essentially acquiring massive control rights in the litigation and turning the original lawyers who brought the case into hourly employees. And it shifted all the conceptions of risk, all the conceptions of how we want lawyers to be running cases. And this was quite unlike anything I had seen. And one of the unfortunate problems of getting older is that whenever you see something that's new, you react, you say, well, that's bad, right? Because that's not what I'm used to. And that was my reaction. <laughs> well, this is just wrong. This is not the way we do it. And then it made me think that there are three functions that we assign to lawyers in the United States and basically concentrate in the bar. One is the selection of cases, particularly on the plaintiff side, particularly in contingent cases. But in all sorts of litigations, we let the lawyers screen. And in fact, Rule 11 and other such responsibilities require the lawyers to do the screening of the cases. 
then we do, we assign to the lawyers the power to prosecute and defend the cases. Lawyers have a monopoly on the capacity to go to court on behalf of a client. So that's the second function that the lawyers perform. And the third function that the lawyers perform is that the lawyers and only the lawyers can be the financiers, the outside financiers with an equity stake in the outcome of the litigation. So the assumption that an American lawyer has going to Australia is that those three functions have to be integrated. And to the extent that they're present in any given case, in any given representation, they have to be carried out by the same person, the same institutional actor, the same group of lawyers. The Australian response, and it was fascinating to confront this, was that each of these functions could be disaggregated and that you can spin them off and that the market could rearrange the rights and responsibilities across these functions in a way that is perhaps more efficient, in a way that is perhaps more transparent, in a way that is perhaps just plain different than the way we do things uh, like that in the United States. And so for me, this was just completely eye-opening. And in several subsequent trips uh, to Australia for other bodies of lectures and so forth, this has become a bigger and bigger part of, my, of what I've been fascinated by. And the first entrant into the field, uh, an outfit called IMF, was spectacularly successful initially, partially because, like any first mover, they grabbed a lot of the low-lying fruit. And, uh, and so they could do very well with relatively little risk. And my sense of going to Australia was that the profits that the funders were making were outsized because there just wasn't enough competition. Uh, there wasn't a deep enough capital bench. And so as I became more comfortable with this system, my reaction was we need to get more of this in, not that we need to restrict it in some way, but it actually this will be a much better functioning system. There may be regulations that we have to put in and all that, but this will be a better functioning system when there's competition within it. And what we see in the United States is the paradox is as it comes here, we have a much deeper capital market. So it is quite likely that we will develop more competitive innovations than Australia, which is a much smaller country, even though we are a late arrival here. And to say the obvious, the Australians then went and colonized. And they reverse colonized England. And they took over Austra uh, Canada. <laughs> And so this has become a dominant model, and the Australians are big movers in setting up litigation finance on the continent also, so that what the experience that they have, the several years head start that they have, has become an entryway into a lot of other markets. So we should be paying attention in this country, in particular, to foreign innovations, which takes us <coughs> to the panel for today. So the the. This morning was basically about um, how we conceptualize the relationship between capital and law and how we try to figure out what rules apply from each and which ones can colonize the other. We're going to go a little bit further t uh, this afternoon, and this panel is about how we conceptualize the role of capital investments in litigation in ways that change the relationship of the actors in the case, in ways that are designed to change the relationship of the actors. So we have three papers. And the first one is by uh, Catherine Piché. Catherine is a law professor at the University of Montreal who specializes on matters of litigation, class actions, uh, big cases, and um, her paper, and Catherine is also an LLM of this institution, so we're very proud of the institutional affiliation. Um, and Catherine uh, is going to talk about a Quebecois innovation in which public money is used to seed private litigation. That is, public money is used to help finance private class actions in areas of law that the, that, uh, the province of Quebec finds to be underserviced. That's a radical conception for us, using public funds for private litigants. There is an article by Judith Resnick, one, one of our graduates also, who argues that the class action is in effect 
a public subsidy for certain kinds of litigation because it lowers the transaction costs of creating the, uh, the, um, the benefits of scale. This is going one step further. Following Catherine, we have Tony Seabach. Tony is a professor at uh, Cardozo. Some of you heard him speak here from the floor this morning. Tony is one of the real uh, forces in uh, examining the development of, uh, of litigation finance. I know that uh, he's not at NYU, but he's just down the street, so uh, at Cardozo. And I know that when I started getting interested in this area, it was his work as much as anybody's that I turned to to help uh, guide me through it. The third speaker, I'm sorry, and Tony's paper does the flip of, of Catherine's. So Catherine is how public money can seed private litigation. And Tony's is on how private money can help seed public litigation. And so if you think about parents' patriae suits as being a more natural form of aggregation that doesn't have the perversity of you know, plaintiff's lawyers running the show, well, the problem is that states are underfunded versus big institutional uh, defendants. And so maybe private resources can help to redress that balance. The third paper is by Tom Coyle, and this is a point of particular privilege. Uh, uh, Tom was a star student in a course on complex litigation. I taught a couple of years ago with Arthur Miller. Tom's a recent graduate of this law school just last year. Works at part-time, uh, only about, what, 300 hours a week, at uh, this small firm called Wachtell Lipton or something. Lipton may have something to do with this room, I think. But, uh, um, and, uh, Tom wrote his third year paper uh, for Troy McKenzie, and then when Troy left, I took over the supervision of it. And I read this paper and I thought, this is just amazing. This is a complete breath of fresh air. This is the idea that sometimes private uh, agglomeration of claims can be superior to public. And that is when we get to the question of Italian colors and the prohibition on class actions, maybe the market can be there instead of the public sector in terms of creating uh, the economies of scale necessary to prosecute some of these cases. So it's very exciting for me uh, to be able to have uh, Tom here and uh, unheard of that he got a day off from Wachtell to, uh, to be here with us. And then the commentator will be Brian Fitzpatrick. Brian is a professor of law at Vanderbilt uh, Brian has an institutional affiliation with us. He was an Olin fellow here for a year uh, before he went uh, into full-time teaching. And Brian is as shrewd a commentator on the structures of legal representation as you will find, and it's always a pleasure. He was here at our conference last year. It's always a pr pleasure to have him here. So with that, uh, Catherine, why don't you begin? Um, good afternoon. I am uh, delighted to be here today and I thank the organizers for having invited me. It's quite a thrill to be, um, to be talking about litigation finance, a topic that is, uh, for my, from my perspective as a Canadian, uh, largely uh, misunderstood, uh, largely under-discussed, um, and so I find this uh, really, really great. Um, so I am a professor at the University of Montreal, as uh, Professor Sakharov mentioned. Uh, and so Montreal is in the province of Quebec. And as most of you, if not all of you know, it is a civil law system with very strong common law influences and a mixed procedural law system. So uh, importantly, uh, it also has a class action. Um, and in fact, Quebec was the first uh, Canadian province to enact class action legislation based on Federal Rule 23 uh, back in 1979. And it was at a very social time. So you will understand and you will feel and you will see the uh, social flair and the social culture uh, piercing uh, from uh, this, well, perhaps the, the, uh, the model itself, the model I'll be discussing today. So one uh, part of the uniqueness of the system uh, was that it provided for a, a Quebec uh, Ministry of Justice fund, an assistance fund for class action litigation. Um, so that is principally what I'll be talking about in the little minutes, a few minutes I have. 
Um, I do want to say that third-party funding exists in Canada and is prevalent. Um, it is a largely underground and secretive practice, which means that we don't have all the information. Um, what we know is that all the big players are there, uh, the Lex Fund and Ethereum and, and all these uh, big financiers are there. Uh, what we know as well is that the courts are quite receptive to uh, these agreements. Uh, they have approved a few uh, financing agreements. Um, what is important to know is that most of Canada has adverse costs uh, that are quite astronomical, and so there's a real uh, problem there in terms of access to justice. Um, so the larger cases are funded um, through third-party funding and um, uh, class uh, plaintiff firms uh, extending um, extending the uh, the monies. So uh, in so that's for kind of the rest of Canada. And in terms of Quebec, uh, we don't have adverse costs. We have uh, capped adverse costs. So that's not really the issue. The issue is the attorney fees, obviously, and the expert costs. Um, so uh, what, uh, what I will be talking about is, and what I've talked about in my essay, is this uh, public uh, fund, assistance fund. Uh, it's the Fonds d'aide au recours collectif, and I'll call it the fund for our purposes. And uh, my argument is that um, it is an effective, um, obviously, financing um, mechanism, but it also has this uh, oversight function that should be underscored and that should be made uh, clearer. Um, and I think this oversight function is beneficial to the whole system and that it contributes to class actions uh, in Quebec, uh, to, well, to the flourishing system that we have, uh, to this positively active system that we have, a system that is often um, characterized as a class action haven. Um, so in short, and that is a social, a more social uh, perspective, but I do think that successful cases should help finance unsuccessful ones, and I do think current cases should help finance future ones. And on top of that, I believe that assistance should be uh, provided to legitimate and promising cases uh, from entities that have the proper motivations. And I do think the fund, uh, our Quebec fund, has uh, these proper motivations. So uh, this uh, fund has a two-parted objective. Uh, the first one, obviously, is to finance class litigation. Um, essentially in terms of uh, bringing those actions uh, in, for instance, and throughout the litigation you can keep applying for further financing all the way through appeals. Uh, the second function is an informa informational uh, objective, uh, and essentially it means disseminating information about class actions, which also is very important in my view in terms of transparency notably. Um, so the fund significantly in terms of statistics uh, has made uh, close to 800 decisions in the last 10 years and has funded one third of uh, those uh, applications. Uh, so on a yearly basis, uh, the market is obviously much smaller, but we have about 500 cases, active cases per year, <coughs> and the fund finances one third of these cases. Uh, the fund also has a big surplus of close to 14 million, which could help uh, finance more and more cases. Um, the fund uh, may, uh, when the fund grants assistance, uh, it will pay expert fees outright, um, and it will help with attorney fees as well. Now, a uh, big caveat there, the attorney fees are not market rate. We're talking about $100 an hour for senior lawyers, which is um, uh, quite insignificant. Uh, but it's still there, and um, uh, the idea is there. And so uh, they pay for legal fees, costs, and this without charging interest fees. Also, and importantly, uh, you will only reimburse uh, in case of success, which means that the fund essentially, essentially assumes the risk of litigation. So it is well capitalized with uh, yearly provincial subsidies and warranties, um, and importantly, um, it, is, it, it is almost entirely self-sustainable through these subsidies that are uh, essentially a couple of hundred uh, thousand dollars a year. But importantly, it does recuperate a percentage of all recoveries in all cases, whether funded or not, which means that all cases uh, help contribute to the fund 
uh, and all current cases help contribute to future cases and to the bringing of future cases. So um, th essentially the uh, argument here is that uh, the fund should work uh, obviously as an, as an oversight mechanism. Uh, it already does de facto. Uh, but I think its role should be redefined and uh, a specific, specific uh, notion in the law should be, should be placed there to, be, to have a much clearer role. Um, of course, one argument was, uh, is, is that it brings transparency to the system, right, with additional uh, information, statistics, data, claims rates data, uh, comes, uh, I, I think, better law and better cases. Uh, the screening mechanism gives, um, thank you. Uh, the screening mechanism gives, uh, of course, incentives to, even if implicitly, bring better cases forward. Right? It's kind of a, a natural tendency to um, to bring worthwhile cases. As when the case is funded, there's a note in the docket, and there's a signal sent that this case may just be more worthwhile. Uh, also, uh, an incentive to be continuously competent in terms of counsel, right, uh, as you can keep applying for further assistance throughout the litigation. So that's significant as well. Uh, it does bring more, um, it, will, it would bring more uh, legitimacy to the fund uh, in terms of an actor of change. The fund has intervened in, uh, and made representations in a number of cases. Uh, in order notably to have this percentage regulation applied more clearly. And so it's, it has changed the law in certain instances and uh, that has been significant. Um, very briefly, the agency uh, cost argument, which isn't mine, it's uh, uh, mainly uh, Professor Birch and Inspector Roth. Um, so, but I really do think there's something there to be said because uh, the fact of having the fund there uh, helps uh, distinguish the roles of the attorneys and the attorneys then become better advisors. Um, also the fund is super, is, becomes this super stakeholder, right? It's an entity that really rec will recuperate some monies, but it will be monies to fund back future cases. So the incentives are not to be compensated, they're very, uh, uh, they're, they're very much, uh, um, they're very, very much a fresh voice, they're very much uh, neutral, and uh, it's always stressful to have the out of time um, in, in our face. But anyway, one <laughs> last thing, I, I guess, is also, we've talked about ethics, and I think uh, having the third entity there really does uh, m help in that sense and lessens the potential for unethical behavior. Perhaps as a conclusion, I would say, I, I do believe in that entity. I think it's very, quite effective and it really does uh, help in terms of the amount of cases that are worthwhile, the numbers of trials. We have the highest number of trials in, throughout Canada and we have a lot of case law and we're very, very active. So it is a, a very important entity. It could do much more and you could even think possibly for uh, the future of having more lawyers working under the fund and bringing cases um, uh, forward that would be uh, financed, uh, perhaps on contingency, but you could mm -hmm. have uh, you could have these lawyers as a part of the age, uh, of the entity. Thank you very much. Before, before you sit down, uh, could you give us a thirty-second synopsis of what the criteria are? for the fund selection of cases? Is it consumer cases? Is it negative value cases? Is it, what's the market failure that this fund is designed to, uh, to cure? Well, I'm not sure it's that detailed. There's something in the uh, regulation and it goes along. Looking at the case um, and at its chances of success, pers it doesn't look at the, at the certification criteria um, and it looks at the need for uh, financing. So obviously, it's, it's just this very uh, plain criteria. And then the decisions are confidential, so we don't really know more about that. The fund has financed worthwhile cases and cases that have not uh, really gone that much you know, uh, ahead. So they, they haven't financed all good cases, but um, there you go. Thank, Thank you. you. The, you know, the, uh, the American reaction to government bodies holding large amounts of money, meeting in secret, and giving it out might be not quite as charitable as the Canadian, but uh, 
Uh, we can leave that to the side for the moment. Tony? Speaking of uh, governments uh, in the United States holding large amounts of money and not knowing what to do with it, um, I am going to speak about what I call uh, litigation investment in public litigation. And this is a bit of a thought experiment. And uh, probably after I'm done talking, I'll be approached by someone who says, well, I've been doing this for a few years now, in which case I will say, well, good. I, I'm glad I at least I anticipated something which is already happening. Um, <laughs> The thought experiment is this. Uh, it's really uh, thinking about uh, the parties who can take advantage of litigation investment. Um, why can't uh, state and municipal governments be parties who take, care, take advantage of, of litigation investment? And uh, I mean, obviously, uh, there's lots of uh, policy justifications for litigation investment. We've talked about those. Uh, one which uh, uh, Professor Wendell and I sort of are interested in is the moral argument uh, that these are property rights that people should have the right to dispose of as they see fit. Uh, my talk today has nothing to do with that. I'm really thinking about the policy argument that suggests that in general we want a litigation system where money flows to uh, the highest and best use to uh, address uh, wrongs that the legal system has announced as wrongs. And uh, the states uh, and municipalities I'm talking about here also um, have a role in that. They, of course, are actors of great importance in identifying uh, wrongs uh, in our civil justice system. Now, a couple of definitions. These are definitions I have stipulated. They are debatable, but I'm going to stipulate them for purposes of this paper. By uh, public litigation, I'm going to refer now only uh, to non-criminal, non-criminal activity by the non-criminal pr um, uh, prosecution, so to speak, by the state. I'm not talking about criminal prosecutions by the state, although Lord knows that those too need support. Um, I'm also not talking about what's conventionally known as the private attorney general, uh, you know, sort of uh, the idea of under civil rights statutes that private attorneys bring claims under as a private attorney general, or or even uh, qui tam. I want to leave that separately. There has been investment in qui tam, uh, to my knowledge, from the litigation investment community. I want to take that out. I want to focus really on a very formalistic definition, uh, focusing on the identity of the of the lawyer and the identity of who the lawyer represents, I want to basically focus on government attorneys representing the state. And the classic example of that would be someone at a state AG's office. <coughs> now, within that definition, um, public litigation can cover, I think, three general areas. I could be missing something here. There's, uh, of course, uh, civil penalties that the state seeks. And the line between civil and uh, criminal penalties, the Supreme Court has looked at this line, but it has asserted, at least again on an arbitrary basis, that there's a certain um, core sense of what is a civil penalty as opposed to a punitive or penal penalty. And uh, so I just want to talk only about this idea that the state certainly can pursue civil penalties, and these civil penalties can be quite significant. I won't go through the examples, but you may be aware of them. Exxon Valdez is a good example. Now, um, in addition, uh, the state, like any citizen, actually has private law rights that can be uh, that can be interfered with. I mean, it, it has property, it has contracts, um, it, it can suffer uh, torts. Um, so the second category are these private law rights that the state is able to seek redress for the way you or I might. And uh, examples of this might include, for example, uh, recent uh, suits about Medicare overcharging. Right. I mean, the idea that uh, the state actually paid too much to uh, the producers of certain drugs. There are a number of suits right now brought by state AG's offices saying we pay too much, we pay too much, not our citizens pay too much, we pay too much. That's category number two. And the third category, which is going to occupy most of my talk, uh, is the parents patriae category. And again, not because the other two aren't interesting, but I think that they're just less um, in lucrative, perhaps. I think parents patriae produces the sort of greatest payoff for the private investor. Now, parents patriae is a doctrine you may have heard bandied about. Uh, its definition is loose. It's also been the subject of Supreme Court uh, analysis. Essentially, uh, there's like two elements of it, I think. Uh, there's a, a, a loss by some substantial number of private citizens uh, of uh, rights, uh, property rights, or other forms of injury in private law. Uh, and the second is that a remedy could be secured 
by the state through police power, through the operation of police power, but it has chosen not to do so. And it could uh, have a second bite at that apple, so to speak, by bringing a parent's patriotic suit, essentially by bringing a suit on behalf of those citizens for the redress of those private law wrongs. Um, a classic example of this would be antitrust. I mean, you often see parents' patriarchy brought by state AGs uh, with respect to consumer antitrust violations on behalf of the losses suffered by the uh, citizens of the state due to the overcharging and antitrust. The grounds of authority for parents' patriarchy are actually not just the common law and the inherent powers of the state going all the way back to the 14th century, but also statutory. There's a lot of federal statutes now which explicitly authorize the state to bring parents' patriarchy actions under state causes of action, I mean, under federal causes of action, such as antitrust. Now, really, the people who have done the most, I think, to identify parents' patriarchy as an interesting topic uh, is my colleague, Miriam Gillis, and uh, her co-author, Gary Friedman. Uh, they pointed out uh, after, in the wake, in some sense, of uh, the double whammy, as I call it, the attack on class certification by the Supreme Court and the uh, attack on class arbitration by the Supreme Court, they pointed out that what might be left in order to achieve many of the same goals uh, that class actions and class arbitrations allegedly secure for us is parents' patriotic suits by the state. And, and of course here, uh, the, the observation is that the Supreme Court has not yet gotten to say that um, the state cannot aggregate the claims of its citizens in a class-like form. There's nothing in Supreme Court jurisprudence on class actions that touches that claim. And secondly, there's nothing so far that suggests that a private citizen signing a, uh, an arbitration agreement can in any way interfere with the power of the state to pursue a parent's patriarchy action on their behalf. I mean, there's a theory, I'm sure it's being cooked up somewhere at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, but it's not yet been actually approved by any court. Um, now, why would this be a good thing? Where's the need for it? Well, obviously, as I've already suggested, there is this issue about the sort of collapse of the class action, but there's also what I call the funding gap, and I don't think I have time to go into all the reasons why attorney generals um, lack funding to initiate their own parents' patriarchy litigation, which is very expensive, but you can imagine that they do have actual budget constraints. Therefore, private investment from the outside could be quite welcome. Now, there already has been a workaround to fund AGs to do parents' patriarchy litigation, and that is borrowing from the tobacco litigation, the idea that contingency attorneys would come in and work on behalf of the state and then take as part of their fee a part of what was collected on behalf of the citizenry. Um, well, this is controversial. It's controversial both for political and I think genuinely got sort of policy-driven concerns. Um, the the policy-driven concern is the loss of control that always happens. It's the uh, problem that's often talked about in terms of class actions in general with entrepreneurial class action attorneys, the loss of control uh, over the litigation uh, uh, when the lawyer has uh, the power to direct the litigation. Now, with uh, outside funding um, to the state that does not uh, take the form of a deal with a contingency attorney, as I'll point out, the state has the choice of what kind of attorney and which attorneys, and if they even want to use outside attorneys. They might just use the money only for expenses, or they might hire an hourly rate attorney. So it gets around the contingency fee uh, attorney disagreement uh, in that sense. Um, now, the other reason why this might be attractive is that there have been laws passed in a number of states, uh, the Private Attorney Detention Sunshine Act and the Transparency and Private Attorney General Contracting Law, uh, which basically are designed to restrict um, the use of contingency attorneys by state AGs, uh, and those, of course, are now barriers. So if I may indulge my timekeeper and say I have four advantages of litigation investment in, in public litigation, then I will stop, okay? Here are the four. First, um, it gives you the option of separating uh, funding legal costs versus, versus funding legal expenses because not all AGs want what they get with a contingency uh, contract. They don't want the other person's lawyer. What they might want just want is funding for their expenses, and they want to do the litigation with the state lawyers that they already have. Not all the time, but sometimes. Uh, second, you might get a better deal. I mean, literally, you might get a better deal. Contingency attorneys uh, often ask for 33%, even from the states, and uh, 
funders might actually take less if you look at the multiple of the amount invested uh, taken from the recovery. Uh, third, and this I think is really important, this allows the state to get the lawyer it wants, not the lawyer who can afford to bankroll the case. Because often contingency attorneys brought in by AGs, while they're great attorneys, and I think Sussman Godfrey is a great firm, often firms that are brought in on, on the contingency side, their advantage is that they are banks. But of course, sometimes the law firm who's a good bank is not the law firm who's the best at an antitrust suit or at an environmental suit. This gives the AG the option of separating banking from lawyering. And, uh, and finally, of course, as I mentioned earlier, it puts the AG more in control, not as much in control perhaps as the critics would like, but puts them more in control than if a contingent uh, fee firm has been brought in and operating as an entrepreneurial class action attorney. And to the extent that we're worried genuinely about control questions, um, I think there's an advantage here. There are disadvantages too, but I'm out of time, so I'm not gonna cover them. <laughs> I might cover them in the questions. Thank you. Tony, one, one quick question before we go on to Tom. Uh, you gave an example in your paper, which I think is a very salient one, of Wyoming having no funds whatsoever. That, that kind of captures the problem you're trying to address. And oh, well, it, it's a study, an academic study of a western state. I, I think it was Utah. And, oh, it was Utah, com right. and comparing it to um, uh, an eastern state, which is West Virginia. And Lord knows West Virginia has had a lot of problems with controlling the mining industry, but it has a lot of mining there. Uh, Utah, on the other hand, hasn't even tried. Uh, Utah has actually no mine inspectors. The Utah has actually zero people now. They rely entirely on federal enforcement. And the explanation for this uh, arguably is uh, lobbying, or the other explanation is they just don't have the money. And this is an example of how uh, if you wanted to staff state lawyers or state investigators uh, financing matters. So I want to uh, first thank everyone for coming today. I'm very excited to be here to uh, speak with you. I feel truly honored to be a uh, part of such a distinguished group of panelists. So a little different from the other panelists, today I'm going to talk about aggregating consumer arbitration claims after the Supreme Court's decision in Italian colors through litigation finance and securitization of legal claims. So my presentation is going to be about three parts. First, I'm going to give a little bit of background on Italian colors so that those of you who are unfamiliar with the case can follow along. And then I'm going to define what I call the Italian colors problem. Next, I'm going to offer a solution to that problem, and I'm finally going to offer a few concluding remarks about the desirability of that solution. So Italian colors was a class action lawsuit brought on behalf of merchants who accepted American Express credit cards. And essentially what they alleged was that one of the provisions in the card acceptance agreement constituted an unlawful tying arrangement. So American Express moves to dismiss the class action on the basis of the card acceptance agreement. And clearly in the card acceptance agreement, it stated that there could be no joinder of legal claims and that either party can compel individual arbitration instead of litigation. So the plaintiffs, they oppose the motion, but not on the basis that the card acceptance agreement was unclear. They oppose it on the basis of something called the effective vindication doctrine. And essentially what that doctrine means is that it's unlawful in an adhesion contract for one party to prospectively waive the right to pursue a statutory right. So the case bounces around and eventually gets up to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court's going to answer this question. Does the effective vindication doctrine prevent a waiver of class treatment in, in an arbitration contract when the economics of pursuing an individual arbitration are completely illogical? So in Italian colors, the largest individual claim would be about $38,000, and the cost of proving a tying arrangement with an expert economic study would be somewhere between $250,000 to $2 million. So no one's gonna bring this claim. It's Posner, only a lunatic would sue over this. But the Supreme Court says the money doesn't matter. They essentially say that as long as a lunatic could sue, then the effective vindication <laughs> doctrine isn't implicated. Justice Scalia, he says that just because you've waived the ability to pursue 
the statutory right in a way that is economically logical doesn't mean that you've waived the right to pursue that statutory right. So consequently, this is what I call the Italian colors problem. And it's a two-fold question. It's if the law won't allow aggregation to make these negative value claims pursuable, can the market step in and provide a manner for aggregation and achieving economies of scale? And then the second question is, if the market does step in, is this actually desirable? So any solution to the Italian colors problem kind of has to conform to three sets of constraints. And the first is that it has to be legally viable. That means that it can't violate any of the terms of the card acceptance agreement, and it can't violate any extrinsic bodies of state law like Chandry. The second is that it has to be practically viable. It can't be some esoteric law school answer, right? You have to be able to actually aggregate these claims. You did well with that. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's kind of a specialty of mine for the last three years. And the other part of practical viability is that any proposed aggregation structure has to provide enough legal certainty so that after <laughs> it's implemented, it can't be challenged collaterally. And the third and final constraint with which a uh, solution has to comply is the most important. This is the real world. You know, The money does matter. And that's it has to be economically viable. So if a litigation financier steps in and aggregates these claims, it has to be able to do so in a way that it can achieve an above market risk adjusted return. So in the interest of time, I'm only going to talk about economic viability today because I think that's probably the most interesting part and not a part that's been covered by a lot of other papers. So my proposed solution is three steps. First would involve aggregation. A litigation financier would go out and contract with individual claimants to sell them essentially an antitrust study for a percentage of any potential proceeds. Now, this method of aggregation creates challenges to economic viability. And essentially, I'm going to talk about why in a little bit, the financier is put in a bad position where it needs to hedge its bet. So I came up with a solution where the financier would offer litigation proceed-backed securities, similar to other asset-backed securities, into the market in order to defray some of its upfront costs. And then after a litigation financier has securitized enough claims that it wouldn't have any capital at risk but could still share in the upside, it would be in a very strong bargaining position to try and achieve a global settlement with the defendant. So the reason that economic viability through aggregating each claim individually is kind of a problem is that, especially in Italian colors, it was a formulaic harm case, right? The only thing that liability would hinge on is the defendant's conduct. And more importantly, and I'm not going to talk about this, but under my aggregation method, it would be the same group of lawyers bringing these claims over and over. So controlling for all these variables, you kind of realize that the outcome of any single arbitration is going to be correlated to the other outcomes of arbitrations. That is, the outcome in one will be predictive of the outcome in another. So rather than the financier having aggregation lead to a series of low-stake coin flips, you get the same economics as a traditional class action. You have one really high stakes coin flip. So the way that a financier can hedge and you know, solve this problem is through securitization. So rather than use the numbers from Italian colors, I'm going to use a little bit simpler of an example. So imagine a financier aggregates 5,000 claims. And 30% of the time, it costs $500 a claim to, to sign it up, right? 30% of the time they lose, 50% of the time they win 2,000, 20% 20 of the time they win 5,000. The claims are 90% correlated. And in order to sell a litigation proceed back security, they're going to have to offer it at a 250% discount. That is, for every $1 a market participant spends in buying a litigation proceed security, that security has to contain the economic right to $2.50 of the expected value of the litigation financier's aggregated portfolio. So the investment profile without securitization will leave the financier with a seriously high stakes coin flip. He's got about $2,500,000 at risk, and he expects to win $9 million if he wins, but if he loses, you know, there's no in-between. So the cost from securitization at a 250% <coughs> discount would be that he would give up about $6 million of his expected return, but he would take in $2,500,000 to defray his costs. So after securitization, you have a much better investment pro portfolio. It's still a coin flip, but it's a coin flip where you either win $3 million or lose nothing, which is a coin flip I would take most days. 
So I use these kind of fake numbers, but in the paper I wrote, I actually modeled out what Italian colors would be worth after a litigation financier, you know, aggregated claims and then securitized them. And, you know, at one of the levels that I looked at, a financier would stand to, after securitizing claims, potentially profit $22 million and have zero capital at risk. So the point is of these numbers that the solution is practically viable and it's very profitable. So there is a market solution and that market solution could you know, really change the scape of uh, consumer ag ag arbitration going forward. So the main criticism to securitizing legal claims is in the words of Professor Zakharoff, any gatekeeper eventually becomes a toll collector, right? I talk about securitizing legal claims and I'm sure all of you are seeing the ghosts of the 2008 you know, RMBS market, that subprime market and this could happen with legal claims, it would be very bad and you know, there's any number of reasons that you shouldn't do this. But my answer to that is it just doesn't matter, right? Because currently under the case law there is no justice being served, right? And some justice is pretty categorically better than no justice. So allowing securitization of arbitration claims will permit the market to step in and fill a void which the current law is prohibiting from being uh, effectively vindicated. So thank you. Tom, just one quick question before we uh, get into the broader discussion. Um, under your model, the financier would then come in and secure all the experts and prepare the econometric studies and then basically that would be the asset that would be uh, available to individual claimants. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. So the financier, in order to be in a strong bargaining position, can't incur any incremental costs when each additional arbitration is brought. So by selling a study as compared to financing litigation, he has a fixed cost, which allows better amortization and increasing the investment portfolio for the uh, And which is also the finance is, is being directly targeted at what the class action obstacle was under the particular case. So under the particulars, it could be different things in different cases. Yeah, of course, in different, in different consumer arbitrations, it would obviously have to be tailored, but I kind of wrote the paper as a case study, so. Right, yeah. That was specific. Uh, so this is following up on, on, the, on my opening observation, but in all of these three cases, what you have is seeking to exploit the division we assume that there should be a division between the traditional uh, integrated functions of lawyer, financier, prosecutor, selector, all these functions that go on in the United States customarily. If we assume that we will disaggregate them, each of these papers is a way of, uh, of taking advantage of exploiting that disaggregation so that you can have uh, private money brought to bear to shore up the public. You can have public money being brought to bear to shore up the private. You can have finance being used to create a different model of aggregation. And so that, uh, that's what's on the table for Brian. Thank you, Sam, and thank you to the panelists. It's my pleasure to be here uh, today. These uh, papers, as Sam says, they all offer different models on how we might bring financing to aggregate litigation. I have a few comments in the eight or nine minutes I have about each of the models that our um, authors have offered us today. But I also have a broader question that I hope we might um, discuss as well on the panel, which is whether we really want to bring all of this outside financing to aggregate litigation. It, it strikes me that the ordinary story we hear about why third-party financing is a good thing doesn't quite apply uh, in the same ways to class actions and other aggregate litigation. And so I hope we can discuss the normative question uh, as well as some of the mechanics behind these uh, proposals. I'd like to start with uh, Tom's uh, presentation, if, if I could. You know, I, I have to be honest with you. I, I, I cannot say that I understood entirely his, his paper. I am from... Nashville, I like to say, I'm just a simple country law professor, <laughs> and so so some of it was over my my head. But I gather the 
proposal here is for financiers to uh, uh, do the upfront expert work in the case, sell the expert work, uh, and also uh, obtain some kind of global settlement authority. Um, uh, but to sell the expert work and obtain this authority to all these various uh, consumers that have arbitration claims. Uh, it, it strikes me as a, a complicated solution to the Italian colors problem. The first question I had was, why don't the financiers just buy the claims, just buy the arbitration claims outright, rather than go through this relatively complex uh, procedure of doing the expert work and selling and have global uh, settlement authority? Why not just buy it? But beyond that, my question about this model is, either way, whether they buy all the arbitration claims up or they sell the study to the individual claimants and obtain this global settlement authority, either way, it seems like the transaction costs of this proposal are very high. Uh, this is basically an opt-in class action model. People are going to have to come forward and opt in either by selling their claim to the financier or by buying the study. And the question then becomes how many people are going to opt in? And how expensive is it going to be to find these people to get them to opt in? And I guess my own intuitions is that opt in is not a very good substitute uh, for the class action. That when we ask uh, how often, for example, do people file claim forms uh, when there's already a settlement and the money is already there waiting for them? Uh, and the answer is often not very frequently do they file those claim forms. And I wonder if not very frequently they're going to buy Tom's uh, econometric study or sell their claim outright to a financier. Um, in the a numerical example that Tom gave, the claim it looked like was worth $5,000 per person. Um, that, I think, is a rare class action, a consumer class action anyway, where each consumer has $5,000 of potential value to their claim. Most consumer class actions are $100 claims or something along those lines. Uh, how much money can a financier invest in collecting $100 claims? Not very much. And so I guess uh, with Tom's model, I just worry uh, that what we, he's basically offering us is to replace the opt-out class action with an opt-in one. And, and I don't think that's going to be very effective. It's how they do financing of class actions, as I understand it, in Australia. Uh, in Australia, they ask the class members to uh, agree contractually with the financier, and they define the class as those people who have agreed to financing with the financier. So they use the opt-in method in Australia, and I'd be curious to, to see some data on how many people, what percentage of the class we actually get opting into those agreements before I am willing to sign on to Tom's substitute uh, for the opt-out class action. Um, I'd like to, to uh, secondly address Catherine's uh, uh, proposal, uh, and, and this is uh, to have uh, the government loan money uh, to class action lawyers. Uh, I think that my reaction here was much like Sam's was. I don't know if it's an American bias or a bias of my own politics, uh, but I guess I'm just skeptical that the government is going to be a better banker than a bank would be. Uh, uh, you know, do we really want the government deciding who uh, to lend money to? Um, who's going to run this government fund? Uh, what are the incentives of the people that are going to run the government fund? Uh, bankers have profit motives, and some of us are suspicious of profit motives. But if the substantive law is doing its job and the jury system is doing its job, then the outcome of a case, um, the more important cases, I think, should be correlated with the ones that offer the most return on investment to outside funders. Big cases should be the ones where there's been lots of harm that's been um, uh, uh, inflicted upon people and lots of deterrence that, that could be affected. And so profit motive is correlated with good cases, I think. And so I'm not afraid of the profit motive. What's the government going to do if it's not pursuing profits? Uh, is the government going to do the social good? Well, uh, what's the social good? Uh, is the government going to reward friends and supporters of the government? Uh, you know, we do have some experience, um, even in this country, with government as bank, and I'm not sure it's a happy one. The most recent example is the Obama administration's program to lend money to solar panel startup companies. And uh, 
as we know, the, the government ended up lending money to campaign supporters of, of the president. And uh, we have other models we could look to. The World Bank is another government lender. Um, I don't know enough about how things have worked out with the World Bank to know whether it's been successful or not. But I guess my own suspicion is, is that um, the government is not going to do as good a job as the private sector would do in finding cases that are worthwhile and investing in those cases. Now, I will say that there are, of course, a number of um, cases that are not going to be attractive to outside investors because uh, they don't offer much in the way of money, but maybe they're about injunctions or other such things like this. And so we need um, other mechanisms to fund cases that don't offer uh, monetary relief. And, and so there certainly is a role for government. Uh, the question is whether even in the monetary cases, uh, those are ones the government should get into. So when we get into the role for the government, uh, that brings me to Tony's paper, uh, where the government brings the lawsuit. And the question is, can we have um, outside financers help the government do that? And um, I think that uh, uh, Tony um, is right that uh, using outside uh, financers to fund government actions is offers a lot of advantages over um, the alternative model of these government lawsuits, which is the government contracting with contingency fee lawyers to bring the suit. I think he's absolutely right. There are a lot of advantages to using the financier as opposed to contingency fee lawyers if the government is the client. There is one, however, disadvantage of the contingency fee lawyer system that is not overcome with uh, Tony's alternative. And I think it's the biggest reason, frankly, why people don't like the current practice of government contracting with contingency fee lawyers, and that is cronyism. Uh, again, the concern is that the government is going to choose the contingency fee lawyer that contributed money to the public official's campaign. And uh, we've seen allegations like that where attorney generals pick their campaign supporters as the lawyers that they hire on contingency for these parents' patriot cases. And I'm worried we're the same thing in Tony's world, that the financier is going to give money to the attorney general and then the attorney general um, turns around and uh, hires that financier uh, for the parents patriot mm -hmm. case. And so uh, I, I think that it, it's, it's uh, uh, worthwhile to think about all these models, but you know, my job is, as commentator is to, is to raise questions about them um, as well. I do want to raise one final question in the time I have left, and that is whether we should even try <coughs> to use financing in class action cases or aggregate litigation. because. I don't think our typical story applies in the same happy way in class actions as it does in individual litigation, and here's why. Um, the, the typical story on why we need third-party financing is that we have little plaintiffs who are going up against big defendants, and the little plaintiffs don't have the money that the big defendants have, and they don't have the risk preferences the big defendant has. They want to use their money for their operations, not to hire lawyers. And because they don't have as much money, they are more risk averse, and that leads them to undersettle cases. They can't, they can't fight it out long enough. They can't go to the, the jury like a big, rich defendant can. And so we're trying to help the plaintiffs, small plaintiffs against big defendants. That really doesn't work so well in any of these government cases, the class action cases. The government is not a little bitty plaintiff. The government has uh, a different risk profile than a small plaintiff would have. Uh, the government is, in many ways, risk averse. I mean, risk, uh, risk neutral. Um, and even in class action cases, we typically have small claimants in class action cases that really aren't risk averse over their $100 loss, for example, to the bank. Um, and in any way, in class action cases, the plaintiffs aren't even the ones making settlement decisions. So we can't worry about them being risk averse and undersettling. And in class action cases, it's really all about the class action lawyer. And so we really have to ask the question, are class action lawyers like little plaintiffs going up against big defendants? <coughs> are governments like little plaintiffs going up against big defendants? And it strikes me that I'm not so sure. I'm not so sure that class action lawyers need help from financiers. A lot of people think the class action system is already rigged against defendants. A lot of people think the class action system makes defendants risk averse. Once you certify a class action case, uh, defendants can't go to trial because one trial is going to resolve thousands and thousands and thousands of claims at once. No defendant can risk that, so they oversettle class action cases. That's one narrative that we see in the literature. And so my question is, if the class action system is special, it's a system where defendants are at the risk disadvantage, 
Do we want to throw fuel onto the fire by adding third party financing in this area? Or maybe is this one area we should carve out and not allow any third party financing at all? Thank you very much. So as moderator, I can anticipate what the uh, paper presenters are going to say because I have papers. Uh, I couldn't anticipate what the moderator was going to say, which took away uh, the bulk of where I was going to go. I was going to uh, lead it with the caveat that Jeff Miller used this morning, which is, I don't necessarily believe this, but um, I think that Brian believes it, so that <laughs> it's all I the don't more necessarily believe it either. But it's all the more effective. But let me, let me make uh, a related point, which is that um, we have in the United States a large number of litigation inducement mechanisms. Uh, some of them take the form of class actions, which is a lowering of the transaction costs for bringing, of, for bringing low value cases. Some of them take the form of fee shifting, which is a subsidy, uh, an increase in the expected payout uh, from litigation. Some take the form of uh, presumed actual damages or liquidated damages in things like copyright, for example, so that it's very hard to prove up damages, but you can get your $1,000 per or under the, uh, the, the fraudulent, the bad facts statute or any of these kinds of, of um, liquidated damages provisions. There is a d longstanding debate in the case law and there's a longstanding debate in that the AOI project on this was unable to uh, make headway on, on the relationship between different kinds of litigation inducement systems. So for example, should you have class actions plus presumed liquidated damages? Is that over deterrence? Is there going to be, are the potential $500 per violation fines simply too much when the cable company sells your information impermissibly, but it does it billions of times because that's how many consumers it has. These are hard conceptual questions, and what Brian's comments uh, focus on is bringing that into uh, the, uh, the question of the relaxation of litigation finance and the, litig and the dropping of the barriers there, which is another form of litigation facilitation mechanism. That's a market form. Now, that raises the question, whenever we expand uh, legal regulation in a way that's designed to overcome uh, some perceived barrier to socially optimal amounts of activity, you want to ask what's the barrier that's there? What's the market failure that we're trying to overcome there? That's why I, I was quite struck in the Canadian context that there's not a series of clearly set out criteria for what they want to, um, to facilitate, what kind of litigation, to use the language from this morning, uh, do they have a sense of public justice as the driving criteria, or perhaps the sense is more broad that all class actions are an advancement of public justice if they prevail, which I suppose is a defensible position, it's just not one that, uh, that seems to be all that articulated and that is I think what gives rise to, uh, in part, Brian's reaction to this. It's a standardless governmental conduct. And in the United States, we believe that standardless governmental conduct in the furtherance of economic activity is likely to give rise to corruption. Whether true or not, that's the underlying uh, motif there. And that's the reaction to, uh, to Tony's proposal also, which is, you're just giving another way in which money can come in the back door to public officials. And we have reasons in states like, let's pick one at random, New York, <laughs> uh, to think that uh, this may actually be a problematic enterprise because sometimes our public officials shockingly are on trial this week on this island, the head of our assembly and the head of our Senate. So w with no views whatsoever as to their guilt. It is rather extraordinary to have them both on trial <laughs> at the same time. Usually you stagger it out for, for <laughs> news coverage purposes. Um, and then, but I think that that leaves open Tom's proposal because Tom's proposal is the cleanest, I think, in terms of 
being addressed directly to a perceived market failure you can identify the kinds of cases that the class action was set up to do to address these are exactly the kinds of cases that a new legal device has foreclosed so we have every reason to believe is under enforcement it may be that most consumer class actions the transaction costs of getting it's not quite an opt in for a reason I'll come back to a second the transaction costs may be prohibitive but in some category of cases they are worthwhile in antitrust cases they are worthwhile and this could be a useful corrective as far as it goes and we don't know until these things are developed we don't know how far it goes and the other thing that's different about Tom's proposal from the standard opt in class action is like in Australia you have people with a direct monetary incentive to figure out how to get people to opt in and the web is a wonderful mechanism for, for signing up people at low cost and there are lawyers around the US who have proved surprisingly entrepreneurial at signing up even very low value cases so I you know it, it, it has you know the reason I reacted as a professor so well is that you know you I don't often get a paper you say, wow, that's interesting. Uh, you say, yeah, 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 all right, I'll give them an A, and then they won't come bother me anymore. But, um, <laughs> but it, it has this idea that you can harness some of the technology, you can harness some of the finance to do this. So, um, so if the question is presented as I would present it, what's the market failure that you want to address? I think that it's clearest in, 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 in my view that Tom's is designed to get at that market failure. I'm not quite so clear in the parents patriae or the, or the Quebecois uh, example that I'm as persuaded of that. So do you all want to respond and then uh, we'll open it up for questions? Or Let's do that. So uh, just a couple of points. I guess, of course, I, th I think um, our view is, is, is uh, our view, the Quebec view is, uh, <laughs> is quite uh, culturally different. Um, it is an egalitarian approach. And I think the idea with the fund is to allow as many cases to be funded in as many different areas of the law. Uh, and we don't know much more about that. Uh, on a yearly basis, a, a lot of, a bunch of attorneys tried through access to information requests to get more information and to predict the cases that uh, will be approved for financial assistance, but we don't really know much more than that. Uh, what we know, however, uh, to respond to um, Professor Fitzpatrick and, uh, and uh, Sakharov is that there, in terms of incentives, there is no compensation really what the fund, uh, what the fund is looking for, is to be self-sustainable. So it's it, it's kind of a two-parted objective: funding future cases and recuperating that percentage according to the percentage regulation. Uh, so really, it's in terms of getting the percentage uh, regulation applied. So that really is uh, what they're looking for. So I, I think in terms of incentives, um, I'm not sure there's an incentive <coughs> for abuse there. Um, and uh, the other thing, and that's more of a comment, and it uh, really is to complete your presentation, uh, we had this huge tobacco trial that uh, ended with a great success, a multi-billion dollar um, uh, judgment. And it's interesting, I think, to see that this case was never, uh, was never funded through third party funders. Uh, it was funded by the fund. So the fund actually provided uh, three to $4 million, which doesn't seem like much but was enough to cover the uh, extensive experts uh, on both sides and the immunologists and all sorts of, of different experts. But it, it made the thing possible and it made um, you know, the trial possible and it made the great outcome possible. So perhaps I'm just an optimist. So uh, I was uh, looking at the list of, of criticisms that I didn't have a chance to uh, review in my paper of my own idea. And I was looking for uh, the one that matches most closely to Brian's criticism. And I see it here at the very bottom, and I, it's one that I'm concerned with, but when I frame it the way I want to, I think it's gonna help me explain to my, my reaction. Which is, you know, there is something a little strange about uh, the Attorney General um, disposing of the state's property. 
without any oversight. I mean, that's what people would say, I think. They'd say, listen, you know, there's going to be a $25 million uh, civil penalty or a $25 million um, uh, uh, collection of, uh, of, of wrongful gains that were taken by uh, Microsoft that's going to be going into the state. And now the Attorney General is going to give $5 million of it to Burford, uh, that's the name of the company. Um, now, you could say uh, that's, that's bad. Now, why is that bad, though? It's, it's, but here's what I think is it's bad because maybe we don't want only one person without the control of the legislature and therefore the legitimacy of uh, the rule of law making such decisions. But it's not bad because um, the government of California is uh, giving $5 million to a third party vendor. The government of California does that all the time. The government of California sells land, it has catering contracts, it hires people to fill potholes. Now it is true that when the government of California or New York does that, corruption can occur. But you know, it seems to be a little odd to say that it's a criticism of this particular approach to solving a problem, which is that the, uh, uh, there's underfunding for uh, litigation on behalf of the citizens of the state, that there may be um, the temptation for the uh, government actors uh, who have been tasked to do this to sell property owning to the state for too little to private citizens, maybe even people who bribe them or who promise them support in future elections. I mean, this is, this is unfortunately a, a problem endemic to um, the complex democracy that we live in. Uh, I don't see, however, that it's a reason to be critical of this particular uh, innovation. So one of the things I talked about in my paper, which I didn't have time to go into, was what Professor Fitzpatrick brought up, and that's, I didn't call it transaction costs, I called it search costs, and that's going out and actually finding these plaintiffs. But the first thing I want to say, and this goes from what Professor Isakaroff said, is that there's this question of compounding litigation inducement mechanisms. So if you look at Concepcion, for example, the consumer arbitration contract in Concepcion had a huge minimum recovery. It was like 7,000 or something. 7,000 bucks, but that still wasn't enough to defray the cost to get people to go. So in a class action, you would worry, well, if you have a 100,000 person class and we're all already allowing you to minimize your transaction costs through the class, then maybe you shouldn't have this litigation inducement mechanism. But in my proposed solution, you don't have the reduction in transaction costs or search costs through the class action. So the litigation inducement mechanism, and in the case of Italian colors, it would be the trebling of damages under antitrust, which made the average claim worth about 1,900 bucks, you don't have the problem of doubling the, in, the inducement mechanism. The inducement mechanism actually fulfills its role because you're not saving transaction costs through the class aggregation. And the second thing about minimizing search costs, and this stems from what Professor Isakaroff said about using the internet, is that I proposed you, you go out and you aggregate claimants in two ways. And the first way you do that is it actually costs money. You put boots on the ground, you go find people who accept an American Express card, and you sign them up. But what you do is you go find the claimants with the biggest claims. Remember, this was a formulaic harm case. So based on your sales volume on American Express credit cards, it's going to determine how much you were harmed by the tying arrangement. So you go and find the companies with the biggest value claims first, and you aggregate them, and you spend money to aggregate them. And then once you have about a break-even number, right, so that you're going to get your potential money back from aggregating them, you go public and you create a media frenzy and you make American Express's stock price go down by announcing you've aggregated all these claims and you're coming after them. And then you ride that publicity and use the internet the way that they do in Australia to have people sign up because these aren't you know, individuals who lost 100 bucks. These are businesses, small businesses, who lost two, $3,000, which to them actually means something. You know, if all they have to do is go click a link on the internet, then you know it's kind of irrational to think that they wouldn't go do that, especially if you're spending money on a media campaign to create publicity and also to increase the pressure on American Express to settle. So by, you kind of get a two-fold benefit. You get cheaper aggregation on the second half and you increase the benefit, the, uh, the desire for the defendant to settle. Okay, well let's Can I ask a quick question of, of Tom? Wh why not just have the Phoenix here buy up the claim? So I would love if you could do that, but you're not allowed yeah, in New York. So state oh. champerty law prevents buying of claims in New York and the oh. contracts in Italian colors were governed by New York law. But also if you just think through it one step further, fine, you can buy the claims. What's to stop the, the, the company from them just writing into the contract, you can't sell this claim? Right, so you're back to square one. Yeah. 
So maybe it would work one or two times if Shanford had been prohibited, but then you know the companies aren't dumb. They're in. Yeah. So, uh, okay, so we have questions from the audience. I think we have microphones. So the first one is uh, Ed Rock, who failed spectacularly this morning at providing <laughs> us a securities law, wants a second chance. So I, I want to I wanna follow up on this last exchange and, and suggest that based on the, the Delaware experience, uh, that, that Brian's intuition that making claims easily tradable is actually central to, to figuring out a, a solution to this problem. Under Delaware law, a controlling shareholder can freeze out the non-controlling shareholder. And there's not a lot that the non-controlling shareholders can do to block it. And that creates an obvious conflict of interest because the controlling shareholder wants to pay a low price. Delaware has two ways of handling this. One is through a fiduciary duty action, which is a class action that has all the problems of class actions. The second is through an appraisal remedy. Historically, the appraisal remedy was viewed as a very, very plaintiff unfriendly remedy because valuation is expensive and appraisal does not provide for any aggregation of claims and no class actions. What's happened in the last eight years, five years or so, is that hedge funds have entered the space and hedge funds have bought up shares of companies that are having freeze outs. They then, quote, they aggregate the claims because under corporate law, if you buy the share, you buy the claim. And hedge funds have made a very nice business out of prosecuting uh, appraisal claims in freeze out mergers. And they hire the lawyers who they want to hire. Some lawyers have taken the view that wouldn't it be better to bring all this within a single firm, as, as Maya suggested this morning. And one couple of lawyers I'm aware of tried to raise a fund to support a private equity sort of fund to fund appraisal actions. But you know, the hedge funds, the, the, the investors weren't so interested because it actually works pretty well if the hedge fund buys the claim and then hires the lawyers. Now, what's distinctive about the corporate context is you can buy the claim by buying the share. It's a very, very efficient way of transferring claims. What we see in the freeze-out context is where you have that kind of low cost, low transaction cost ability to aggregate claims, you can get a pretty effective and efficient outcome. Now, this is a little bit like the early history of, uh, of uh, the use of litigation finance and patent, where you bought effectively the firm, and because the firm was the claim, and the claim was the right to litigate, and so in the tr corporate transaction, as it were, which is just meant for just buying the company, you bought uh, the rights to all the claims that it might have. Uh, yes, so. Um, the example of being able to buy a clear shot, and own the claims that are within the company, which can be death knell claims, is a perfect uh, platform to say what Tim was saying earlier today is there is no reason in the world to uh, prohibit the sale of claims or to prohibit the sale of control, so long as you have some rules and regulations that might uh, govern it. So this whole uh, very important part of the industry is, is I think, answered through that. And then you have corporate uh, regulations. But if, if I can get back to one thing that Tony said. Um, Tony, I've tried what you have just said, and that is going to the tax authorities in England because they don't know what they're doing and they burn basically claims for tax of hundreds of millions of dollars. They don't even know how to pursue it. And, uh, and I, I've gone to the SEC here and what I, they've, I've gotten the same reaction. I Granted, I haven't really explored it, but the reaction is, no, we're not gonna do any funding. Number one, we don't like funders. It's still a bit, now, at that time, it was still a bad reputation. But number two, we're not gonna pay what the funder's gonna want. Uh, we just don't pay two or three to, or four to one. Uh, we're the government. So if you wanna do this, if you wanted to hire, we would pay you 
a fifth of what you'd get in, in your practice. Uh, so I find I found that as a real block to what you're suggesting. I wish it weren't there. Let's take one more question, then we'll go back to the panel. Go ahead. Wait, wait a second. Let's, let's get the microphone. I have a question to Tom, and I think it relates back to Lee Drucker's presentation early in the morning when he said... Uh, quite provocatively, that uh, legal claims are just like bonds or other classes of assets. And mm, there are obvious differences. So I agree that there might be some um, kinds of claims uh, whose value is enough to make it worthwhile to aggregate them through funding. And I think it's a, it's a fascinating idea of another way of informal aggregation. But the, the problem, uh, the practical problem uh, with then uh, converting th that into securities is that you don't have a definite duration of your asset. Now, this in itself will make uh, a big chunk of uh, institutional investors uneasy. There are ways to, to deal with that, mainly by discounting the value uh, based on some assumed you know, time to money, so the time to final resolution and then to payout. Uh, but if you start doing that, you might need to depress the, the net present value of this, this pool so much uh, that, again, you're running the risk that there is a very limited universe of claims that would actually work that way. So I was wondering if you, if you thought about it. So I did think about that, and I guess I should have mentioned this in my presentation, but securitizing litigation pro c back securities, it's, it's not novel. It actually happens. So the context in which it happens is mergers, right? So you have two companies who want to merge, and one of them has like a really strong claim against a third party, but you can't value that claim, so it makes valuing the merger impossible. So what companies will do is they'll spin off the potential proceeds from the unvalued claim, and then they'll issue like just in a normal spin off shares to their shareholders to preserve the value of that claim and then they'll value the merger based on the company not having the claim. So this has happened before, and it happened in 1999 in the Windstar litigation. So in the Windstar litigation, you, well, sorry, one thing, usually when, when uh, they do this in a merger, it's a CVR and it doesn't become freely tradable, a contingent value, right? But um, in 1999, they actually, they registered the litigation proceed back securities for the Windstar litigation, and they traded in the market and there was actually significant demand. So they opened around seven, and I think the high traded around 17 and a half, the low traded around five, over the entire unknown duration of the claims. And further, at the peak trading volume, when like it looked like a settlement was on the table, it was about 1.3 million shares a day. Uh, average is about 250, but you know, there is market demand there. And you know, not, to, not to scare people, but if 2007 taught us anything, like bankers, bankers can sell a security, right? You know, whether, whether or not that's a good thing, it's right. not something to opine on. So the durational problem really is, is a problem in, in offering the security. But, you know, if you just look at it, take a step back and look at precedent, there was market demand. So, you know, you might as well try it, I guess. Yes. About your intriguing proposal, let me confess first, I haven't read the paper and I didn't fully understand it, but I detect that there are three assumptions there and all three of them seem to be shaky. One is that there's some kind of correlation or predictability, be a better word, it could be expressed mathematically, based on the fact that you're only dealing with the, contact, the conduct of the defendant, Amer American Express, except if you're dealing with thousands of individual arbitrated cases and hundreds of different arbitrators. Nobody can be more arbitrary and unpredictable than an arbitrator. I've done a lot of practice with, with, with uh, administrative law judges, and I know on the same case, uh, two judges can be diametrically apart, and I'm not sure you can get that kind of certainty. One arbitrator in Idaho has this way of approaching it, another one has another. They may switch arbitrators, American Express would use as many different arbitrators as possible. Second assumption is that they're going to be economies of scale because the, all the prep work is being done by one organization. However, it, that's hard to quantify because again, 
one arbitrator may want papers in a certain format or he won't accept them at all. Another one has got to be three hole punched at a 45 degree angle. And everything they make it up, and again, I've seen this thing in, act, in actual law practice with administrative law judges and with dealing with hundreds of arbitrators, the procedures become arbitrary. The form of the evidence, they'll accept what's convincing to one may not be convincing to another. So that things may constantly have to be reformatted so that your economies of scale are, are diminished when you have to reinvent the wheel for uh, every arbitrator they do it. And that leads to the third one, with that degree of uncertainty, would you really be able to, secu to securitize it without giving the potential investors a, uh, a mathematical basis to see what their return is likely to be? And that's, you know, I could be completely misinterpreting what, what you're saying, but those are the three things that hit me as I listened to it. Okay, let, before we answer, there's, let's take two more because we're running out of time. Yes, and then Josh. Yes, uh, I, I'm sorry, I don't know your, your name. Um, I haven't a clue uh, whether this system exists uh, in other countries as well, but in Germany, for uh, since many years, um, people who have uh, no money to go to court or to uh, which have been sentenced to court, uh, they um, uh, will be uh, paid the all costs if the judge is um, has decided that uh, the case uh, will be successful. So. Um, uh, people who have no money and live uh, um, on uh, with money on the state uh, have absolute free um, access to, uh, to justice and to, to the courts. I think it's a quite good system. Okay, and so we have the German social welfare use of litigation, which is not just for public, but also private insurance in Germany provides litigation assistance. It's a very different system than ours. Yes, Josh, last question. Thank you. Um, this question is for Brian uh, in response to the question that you posed at the end of, of your presentation, which was asking whether because essentially class action attorneys are big boys who can fight against the well-funded defendants, whether there's a need for litigation finance in the class action space. I'd ask you to consider uh, two scenarios. First, there's a huge adverse impact amongst the plaintiffs in those classes while they wait for the litigation to conclude. Yes, in the $100 cases against the banks that you point out, there may not be that adverse impact. But in large cases, like BP oil spill, the Pew Hip case, transvaginal mesh cases, people need surgeries, they need living expense money directly as a result of what happened to them. And litigation finance, I'd propose, plays an important impact in providing the access to justice, uh, standing up for the little guy like you propose. The second thing I'd say is while the attorneys are well-funded, they might be too well funded. And I think litigation finance has a role to essentially take some of the windfall away from class action attorneys and put it back in the pockets of plaintiffs using litigation finance as a means to compete against the contingency fee, something that Tony mentioned in one of his proposals. Thank you. Um, unfortunately, while we had an excellent panel, we had a lousy moderator who did not read the schedule properly. So we have chewed into the, a little bit of the time of the next panel. So. I'm sorry, but you cannot answer anybody. <laughs> and we are done, and let's thank the panel.